Okay. Shouldn't be. I'm, I'm introducing the introduction. Yes. <laughs> yes. introduction. Um, so yeah, and I think it's. I think I was just. I was asked to do this because, um, kind of Chen and I are both deeply involved with the Daniels Fund, and the Daniels Fund grants to mines and. Um, this is the last lecture that the Daniels Fund is going to be supporting for this grant series or cycle. Um, so for the last four years, we have used their monies um, to bring world-class speakers to campus, including our speaker today. Um, and we are ending the series today with someone I'm super psyched to hear from. Uh, we want to sincerely, sincerely thank the Daniels Fund for their support over these last years, um, in which in addition to these lectures, has allowed us to start a professional ethics library on campus, to train faculty to incorporate ethics into their courses, and to start an online collection of ethics lessons, plans, assessment strategies, etc. Um, in addition to the money from the Daniels Fund, the Division of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences has been integral to the success of the program, providing support and space for the program to grow. In my opinion, perhaps the best product of the Daniels Fund grants has been the hiring of Dr. Chen Su, first as a postdoc and then as an assistant professor in Haas. He was hired to help administer these grants, but has turned into a vital new voice in our department and on campus. I could never have foreseen the different ways these grants would impact the Mines campus, and I look forward to more collaborations with Daniels in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn these things over to Stevie Ray, who is going to introduce our guest. Right. Well, thank you, Sandy. And, and just before I introduce uh, our speaker today, um, I want to uh, a note to everyone attending, if you could please um, enter any questions that you have uh, for our speaker into the Q&A function. It should be all the way on the right um, uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen here. Uh, that allows, uh, first of all, you, you can monitor that and um, uh, uh, promote questions that you want to see answered to the top so we, we can keep track of the, uh, the, the the most popular burning questions. And I'll be moderating those. Uh, if that's okay with you, Reddit, I'll, I'll um, handle that in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, we are excited today to have with us uh, Dr. Reddit Abebe, um, an assistant professor of computer science at UC Berkeley and a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Uh, Dr. Abebe uh, received her PhD in computer science from Cornell University, uh, where her dissertation also received the 2020 ACM SIG KDD Dissertation Award. Um, she also holds graduate degrees in mathematics from uh, Harvard and the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Abebe's research is in artificial intelligence and algorithms with a focus on equity and justice concerns, which makes uh, her research really fascinating, not just for our, our audience here at Minds, but specifically for uh, our Daniels Fund speaker series. Um, uh, she was a, uh, the, or is the co-founder of both the Mechanism Design for Social Good, a multidisciplinary, multi-institution interdisciplinary initiative, and uh, Black and AI, a nonprofit organization that tackles equity issues in artificial intelligence. Uh, and she's also been honored uh, with the MIT Tech Reviews, um, or been named to the MIT Tech Review Reviews 35 Innovators Under 35, and uh, as one to watch on the Bloomberg 50 list. So, uh, uh, and I mean, besides all that, we'll just keep on adding to these accolades. <laughs> but besides all that, her work has informed uh, policy and practice at the National Institute of Health and the Ethiopian Ministry of Education. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Rediet Abebe and uh, her talk today, Modeling the Dynamics of Poverty. Thank you so much, CV. Let me try to first do the kind of logistical bits to make sure that we are that we're going to be fine. So I'm now sharing my screen, and um, it should show you my my slides. Um, it should show you roles for computing and social justice. Does that is that the case? Yes. Yes, we oh, are. Excellent. So very good. So um, it's a, a huge honor for me to be here. I was really uh, excited to receive this invitation and to share my work to have this platform to share my work with um, such a diverse group of people. Um, so 
I, I appreciate you thinking of me and I appreciate everyone who's here. I know um, Mondays are not the easiest days. So uh, after submitting my abstract to for advertising for this talk, I decided to actually change my talk a little bit. I will talk about some of what was discussed in the abstract as part of my talk, but I want to just step out um, a little bit and talk about something uh, broader, which is uh, roles that computing can play in social change and social justice. And I wanted to do that because one, I think it sort of more um, um, accurately captures some of the, the things that are keeping me up at night these days. And I know a lot of people are also uh, thinking about many of these same things. And it also captures uh, so much of what I've learned from the social sciences and humanistic studies. So I, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to, to demonstrate that and to kind of get your input on that as well. So in many ways, the world is kind of really falling apart. Right, so in the US where many of us may be based, we've had, uh, we we're in the midst of a, well, globally we're in the midst of a global pandemic where uh, we've, uh, we've lost millions of people. Um, even in the US, we've lost over half a million people. Uh, I think we've gotten a little bit desensitized to that, but um, you know, it's happening every single day. People are losing um, important people in their lives every single day and it doesn't really show signs of stopping anytime soon. So I think it's important to recognize the emotional toll that that, uh, that, that has on uh, those of us who are lucky enough to survive this. Um, uh, we also know in the US there's been violence against black um, and African-Americans in the US, uh, police violence, especially um, that has gone on for you know, the duration of this whole, um, of, this, of this, the formation of this nation. Um, and this summer it had sort of reached a breaking point um, at least in how we talk about it, which I think um, has uh, has brought up a lot of different things. There's um, attacks on immigrants um, uh, in Ethiopia, where I'm where I'm from, uh, where most of my family is based. Uh, there's a massive humanitarian crisis. There is a war happening on uh, the no northern part of the region that uh, is leading to sort of really uh, serious atrocities, right? And so, you know, none of these things are new. We've had wars before. Um, we've had pandemics before, you know, we've had attacks on uh, different uh, marginalized groups before, but it really does feel like we're in a moment where so much is happening, you know, all at once, right? And it, it feels like a sort of a, a moment where we could decide what direction uh, we're going to go and what we're going to fight for. And in some ways also, there's now this um, this moment to, to really recognize, not just recognize, but not be able to deny the many ways in which uh, these complex and longstanding problems are intersecting one another in sort of unsustainable and crushing ways. So one that we talk about uh, more of these days, uh, which I think is good, is uh, that a lot of uh, Black Americans um, in the US, for instance, are dying at much higher rates as the general population, much higher, uh, much higher rates of being hospitalized, uh, much higher rates of uh, being infected, um, and things are comparably bad for American Indian and Hispanic and Latino uh, uh, persons. And even when we talk about relief, we are noticing that uh, many people are left out of uh, these kind of much needed resources that the government could make available. So one group of people is immigrants, and in particular, um, undocumented immigrants, which we know constitute a large portion of our essential workforce and yet are left out of uh, programs aimed at assisting uh, families in these desperate times. And it's not just immigrants. I mean, at this moment, no one really is getting the help that they need, but I think it's important to recognize these sort of intersectional um, uh, oppressions and, um, and how those can make things, things that are already bad way worse. And so a question that you know I ask myself basically every day, and I know many people are as well, is what the heck are we gonna do about all of this, right? These problems, as I said earlier, are not new. Um, they've always been there. They're, they've always been acutely felt by, uh, by those who are marginalized and those that are inter intersectionally marginalized, especially. It's always been a sort of all hands on deck situation. But right now, a lot of this is kind of coming to the forefront in a way that is uh, difficult to ignore by anyone, really. You don't have to belong to these marginalized communities to recognize just how terrible things are. Um, it's inescapable. And so many of us, I hope all of us, are asking, what are we going to do about this, right? There's real suffering, real pain, and we want to contribute to this in some, in some meaningful way to move the needle in the right direction. So if you, like me, are in computer science uh, or a quantitative field, and you like sort of data-driven and algorithmic methods, 
you may seek to use those skills to uh, potentially help understand these problems or help alleviate these issues. Um, and, and maybe even to do so in a way that moves things in the right direction, in a way, uh, move things uh, in, in a direction whereby we can bring about incredibly long um, overdue structural changes that we need to create more equitable and resilient societies. Because the reality is that uh, when this pandemic is over, all pandemics are not over. In fact, uh, we think that this is going to be one of many that we may experience um, in our lifetime, violence against immigrants, against Black Americans, African Americans, ethnic minorities, um, it's, not, it's just not going to go away, right? And so we want to create long uh, uh, structural changes that are, that are much needed. And so, um, so for me, as a computer scientist, as someone who's computational um, and likes algorithms, I think about how I can use those skills to contribute to something, uh, to something meaningful in this space, to contribute to sort of the types of social changes um, and social justice issues that we would like to bring about. But there too, we have a lot of bad news, right? So uh, we've seen in the past several years, especially that these attempts can really backfire. Um, so for instance, uh, you might be aware of a study from uh, an, a, an article from 2016 that showed that um, risk assessment tools that were uh, sort of meant to, well, they're meant to do a lot of things, but in effect, what they ended up doing was essentially um, ossifying and exacerbating racial bias in risk assessment in the criminal justice system by uh, leading to uh, Black uh, individuals being um, incarcerated um, uh, and being held uh, at much higher rates um, and in ways that were incredibly un unjust and un unfair. Uh, and we even know that in even in situations where algorithms are being designed with vulnerable communities in, in mind, for instance, if you're thinking about poverty alleviation, which uh, Virginia Eubanks talks about in uh, both in her book, Algorithm uh, Automating Inequality, but really her broader work, she shows there that even these algorithms that are designed with vulnerable communities in mind have sort of had uh, terrible uh, uh, negative externality. So one of the things that Virginia Eubanks points out is that they sort of create this, um, what she calls the economic rationing of the past, rather than actually get, trying to get to the root of poverty and these um, and these issues, they end up sort of taking a lot of things as given and sort of shuffling resources around in hopes that that will that that will solve the problem. And in fact, it really won't. And critical scholars, um, I just want to make sure my slides are advancing, right? Because sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, we're, okay, we're just, we're just making sure. Okay, good. Um, so critical scholars have really, I've have done a lot of work about these deep issues of um, trying to use computing for social good. And I synthesize it into three key points that I that I walked away with. There's way more. Uh, so they point out, uh, critical scholars point out solutionism, which is that there may be a tendency to, um, to use algorithmically informed interventions as a sort of solution, right, as a, to see them as a sort of solution, and, and in doing so to um, not necessarily have a nuanced under, understanding of the problem and to minimize um, other contributions in this space. Uh, there's also a sort of tinkering that happens where a lot of times we take a lot of um, unjust social political uh, systems as being fixed, and we just sort of try to optimize around them, and that has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of downsides, including that uh, if you take some things as given, it makes it much much harder to change them uh, in the long run. And so, in some ways, actually, uh, just trying to optimize around some things, even if in the short run it's improving something, could in the long run actually um, uh, it be a net negative. And there's, there's also a sort of diversion that happens kind of related to the solutionism, but not exclusively, where uh, if you put an algorithmic solution or an algorithmic intervention to a problem, then that ends up attracting a lot of attention, right? So the algorithm ends up attract, attracting a lot of attention. That's just always been the, the case. Whatever is like the hot new thing ends up being the thing that drives a lot of attention. But it could actually distract away from the root of the problem and other ways of addru addressing that problem, right? So that's just a lot of bad news. We're in a state that um, feels like a kind of a, a series of unending crises. We, some of us have a set of skills that we would like to bring um, to the table to sort of support meaningful social change, but there too, we're seeing a lot of uh, warnings and things that have gone terribly wrong. And so you can ask, what are we gonna do? And in particular for myself, I asked, uh, does computing have any roles to play in social change and social justice, the kinds of social change that I would like to see in social justice that I hope we'll make progress on. And it's important to ask this, right? Because it could be the case that it doesn't, right? It could be the case that maybe we're better off 
studying something else, uh, taking our time, our skills, our uh, interests, and and doing something something else with it. There's no uh, end to the list of things that need to happen. And so this was, you know, it's it feels like a really long time ago now, but this was a question I asked myself uh, back in 2015 when I started my PhD at Cornell uh, to study computer science. And at the time, you know, there were things that were going wrong as well. And so it wasn't, you know, an unusual question to ask, you know, does computing have any roles to play? But since then, you know, that question has become more and more and more pressing. And so what happened while I was at Cornell was I ended up having uh, really, uh, I, I would say a series of conversations, but it's actually like so many conversations. I feel like it was, you know, nearing like a hundred, maybe it's not quite a hundred, but we had many, many conversations with um, many folks at Cornell, especially the folks that you see here uh, uh, whom I, with whom I ended up writing a paper that was presented at the Fairness, Accountability, and, Accountability and Transparency Conference last year, where we asked ourselves this, you know, we asked ourselves this hard question. Many of us are, uh, uh, ourselves computer scientists or people who study computer science, right? And so we wanted to uh, reflect on this and try to come up with a, an answer that feels comfortable to, our, to us. And what we did in the course of these conversations uh, that we didn't necessarily uh, hope to actually write a paper on, we were just trying to uh, get, get, get a, a solution for ourselves that feels comfortable or get an answer for ourselves that feels comfortable, right? And in the process of having these conversations, we thought of many different examples that we really liked, that are computational, that we felt like actually contributed something meaningful uh, to the types of social change that we wanted to see. And so the conclusion that we've reached at least then and, and now, and hopefully will continue to, to be the case um, in the future too, is that we do think that um, computing can play, play a role. Um, it's not gonna be the only role, but it can play one role as a constructive ally to bringing about the types of change that we would like to see. Social change is the work of many hands. There's no one field that will have all the answers, but many fields together could, could come up with one, with one answer that could be satisfactory. And so here, the role of computing, I want to emphasize, is not meant to be uh, the most central role. It's not uh, meant to be, um, it's not meant to be even the most important role, but we think it's it's a complement to something, some, some of the um, sort of the movements that are already happening, some of the things that we're already seeing that are, um, uh, that are positive and that are interesting. And so we sort of came up with a framework. I'm not gonna be able to cover the full framework here, but I'll uh, mention a couple of things, um, a couple of examples of roles that computing can play. And um, hopefully I'll drop a link to the paper in the chat and you can uh, take a look at the paper, happy to continue the conversation in the Q&A or, um, uh, or you know, uh, offline if you, if you would prefer. So the first role is one that comes uh, very naturally to us as computing scholars, which is the role of computing as a diagnostic. What this role says here is that we think that computing can help us uh, measure social problems and diagnose um, uh, how they kind of uh, 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 measure them and precisely characterize how these problems manifest in, um, in, in various systems and especially technical systems, right? So this is not meant to be any solution, it's not meant to be, uh, you know, even the only type of measurement, but it's just saying, look, if we want to solve some problem, we, we may need to understand the scope of the problem, how bad the problem is, uh, where, uh, what areas it's pervading, and so we need to understand that, and so we can try to measure that first before we try to uh, brainstorm um, potential interventions or solutions. So if you think of just examples, right, if you think back to um, works that are now considered uh, quite classic in our field. So uh, one work would be by Professor Latanya Sweeney, who is a professor at Harvard University. She uh, wrote a paper, Professor Sweeney wrote a paper back in 2013, which in computer science years is like a, you know, a century ago, right? Uh, that showed racial bias in ad delivery. And in particular, what this work shows is that if you go to a search engine like Google and you type um, common, uh, names that are commonly associated with African-American individuals, such as Latanya Sweeney, then you're more likely to see ads that are um, undesirable. You're more likely to see ads, for instance, that are arrest-related as the one that you see uh, in the screenshot here. That, that I should add that that ad no, no longer exists that I know, but I think it's you know partially because of this work being so popular, right? And so this is one form of discrimination that you can see in, in, in this ad delivery, because if you're searching for a name that's not commonly associated, that's let's say that's commonly associated with sort of Western names, then you're less likely to see this. 
Um, and I should add also that, uh, you know, Dr. Sweeney um, had, had not been arrested at that point, right? So this ad was not really related to, to anything here. And so in this way, what this work was doing, it wasn't trying to come up with any particular solution. It was just identifying a problem and trying to measure it and trying to precisely characterize it. Um, and that has led to um, a lot of changes that are, uh, that are positive. And really, if you've been you know, paying attention to this area or have been engaged in this area or work in this area, and you look at you know, any papers that come to mind for you, they may end up having a lot of, a lot of this like, kind of diagnostic flavor. So if you look at, for instance, the work of Joy Balamwini and Dr. Timni Gabru, uh, they have work on gender um, and skin tone uh, bias and facial analysis that has a sort of diagnostic flavor. There's work on uh, bias and word embedding, work on racial bias and healthcare algorithms, which we hinted at earlier, uh, racial bias and speech recognition, and really the list goes on. And so I, I very briefly, what I want to do is I want to show you just sort of how this diagnostic flavor could play out. Uh, using one uh, one of my own one of my own works, where we looked at uh, people's health uh, people searching for health information on search engines, um, and in particular, we looked at the African continent. Um, and this is a 2019 paper. We looked at the African continent, and we wanted to ask, um, you know, there's a sort of data inequality, right? We, if you're looking at a disease like let's say HIV and AIDS. Um, we don't even know how many people have died of AIDS every year in any given country in the continent. There are a lot of issues. For instance, uh, we know that death certificates um, like this one contain a lot of uh, very serious errors. And so we really don't know, um, uh, we really don't know even how many people have died of, a, of this disease. And so certainly we don't, we also don't know for instance, what information do people have about where to get tested for HIV, or uh, what are the symptoms of HIV, or you know, um, uh, you know, how does it get transmit transmitted, and things like that. And so, what we did in this work is we took uh, a lot of search queries over a period of eighteen months that are associated with um, HIV or AIDS across all fifty-four nations in the continent. And we used a set of techniques uh, from uh, sort of topic modeling and natural language processing to map out uh, uh, very, these various clusters of searches that we, that we saw. So these clusters that you see here as kind of these like uh, semantically linked words uh, really showed like a kind of a, a, a theme across these searches. So for instance, we saw searches associated with symptoms that had words like pain, uh, limb swollen, uh, nodes and things like that. Um, uh, searches associated with anti antiretroviral drugs and treatment, uh, searches associated with breastfeeding and pregnancy, but also things that we know to be hard to survey like uh, stigma and discrimination and natural cures and remedies and healthy lifestyles, right? So not only um, are you able to see kind of uh, how frequently people are asking questions around what are the symptoms of HIV or are swollen lymph nodes a sign of HIV, you can also see uh, patterns around stigma and discrimination like people asking if I'm HIV positive, can my boss fire me? Which unfortunately the answer is yes in some countries or um, you know, there's not necessarily like a legal protection against preventing that, right? And so you're really seeing a lot of questions and inquiries that people have and patterns across time, across geography, across demographics to try to understand what information are people seeking and how are those information needs being met? And so you can do like a sort of deep dive uh, to get a better sense. So for the natural cures, uh, we saw uh, kind of the most popular ty types of searches um, and they were associated with things like certain prophets healing HIV and AIDS and certain healing prayers and things like that, but also uh, things around black seed oil, uh, olive leaf extract and lemon baking soda and honeybee venom and really all sorts of things. And the reason why I wanted to show this to you is because in a sense, this, this work that we were doing was surfacing emerging questions that people had that were not necessarily documented. So for instance, honeybee venom curing AIDS is not something that I had heard up until that point, right? Or people asking about honeybee venom curing AIDS was not something I had heard up until that point. So I, we took a bunch of these, we like searched around to see whether there are any blogs or articles or anything on it. And for some of these, there weren't, right? And so these are sort of like emerging questions or beliefs that are, uh, or potentially misinformation that are, uh, that are kind of happening that you can see streaming through your data, right? And you can kind of use that to get a sense of um, any changes in people's um, sort of attitudes towards the disease or, um, or uh, kind of information or misinformation that might exist. And so that already has helped um, in supporting some um, 
uh, some kind of data collection and survey collection efforts. I won't get into it. But I also wanted to emphasize it wasn't just that we measured kind of the user side of things, like what are people showing up and asking. We also wanted to measure how are, how is that information need how are those information needs being met. So for instance, if I sit down and I ask, does garlic cure HIV? What answer do I get? Right. And what we noticed at the time, I think since then it's been removed, is um, if you searched for does garlic cure HIV, or really like there was a bunch of other um, pretty troubling examples that, that I could have showed, you see that the top website that you that is shown, it's not just that it's the top website, it's actually highlighted as, as a sort of like a prominent website, is from, uh, is, is from a website called miracleofgarlic.com. And I read through this homepage. I'm not a science, I'm not a you know a, a, a medicine or a public health expert by any means. But even I could immediately see that there were a lot of uh, that there was a lot of ascientific information here. And so you might say, well, okay, that's too bad. But maybe it would have happened if I was searching for you know do antiretroviral uh, drugs treat HIV as well. And it turns out not only does it not do that, actually the web page entirely looks very different. So the top website that you see here was a website that our, um, we had a bunch of uh, kind of experts in medicine and, and health uh, rate the content of these websites. So this was a website that was rated to be, uh, that was rated highly by, uh, by the folks who helped us with this. But it wasn't just that the top website, it's also what you see here um, uh, on the whole page. You see that there is a Wikipedia page on the right that shows management of HIV um, and AIDS. It shows you suggested queries around a table of FDA approved antiretrovirals um, and kind of drug interactions and things like that. And so the user satisfaction between these two, when I'm searching for does garlic cure HIV versus does uh, and, uh, you know, antiretroviral therapy HIV seems to be very different. And we were kind of able to measure this. And so, in this work, we found that, you know, unsurprisingly, if you're searching for, uh, if you're searching for questions associated with natural cures and remedies, it rated very low on average. The content that people were showed uh, rated very low by health experts. Um, it rated at about 1.5 out of five, whereas those associated with stigma and breastfeeding uh, and antiretroviral drugs rated highly. And uh, the natural cures and remedies, I would have guessed, would be low, but the other ones, I wasn't really sure. And in particular. It's concerning to see that questions associated with symptoms um, of HIV are not always generating content that was rated highly by health experts. And I, I mentioned that it's concerning because you know, symptoms is one of the most popular topics uh, for searches that um, people are, uh, are entering into these, into, these, into, into these search engines. And so, uh, so we were able to kind of measure not just what people are asking, but also what content are they getting. And that helped us try to understand this information ecosystem a lot better. In particular, you, you might think, okay, this is really not good. We wanna do something about this, but to intervene, you need to understand what are some potential points of intervention. One of them is just what people are searching. We don't have control over that. We don't wanna have control over that. And so we leave that, but we do notice that, you know, when someone searches for something, then the search engine itself makes a series of decisions, right? So for instance, if you type something and there's a typo, right? Let's say I type does garlic cure HIV, but I spell garlic with a K instead of a C, right? The search engine does kind of back end processing um, sort of in the background. And it's that is done so that it can map your uh, search query to, uh, to the best kind of quality pages that it could get, right? And so what we found here was that that kind of back end processing was happening significantly less for searches associated with natural cures and remedies. And so there's a sort of discrepancy here um, in, in how the search engine itself was acting. And so that was an important thing to, to measure and to try to understand. And besides that, we also found that even if the search engine was doing a perfect job, whatever that means, right? Of course, there's not a perfect job, but even if it was not you know, troubling in any way, we also found that actually there's not that many web pages available from high authority websites on natural cures and remedies. And so if I restricted myself to web pages associated to, uh, two web pages from the CDC, UNAIDS, NIH, and the WHO, but I still asked questions associated with natural cures and remedies, sometimes I could get zero web pages that the search engine could show me, right? And so a lot of these high authority websites, which would typically float to the top of our results page, 
are not necessarily even having web pages available. They seem to have, you know, five um, to seven times as many web pages on drugs and uh, uh, and antiretroviral drugs than they do on natural cures and remedies, right? And so again, I want to mention here that you know this work measures a bunch of things. We didn't necessarily try to come up with any sort of intervention. We wanted to understand what are the different sources of uh, inequality here, information inequality, and kind of user experience inequality here. And hopefully that can lead to sort of interventions that would be um, uh, fruitful and moving things in the right direction. And so I spent quite a bit of time working with folks at the NIH. Uh, throughout 2019, I was part of a, a, a working group on um, artificial intelligence uh, in at the NIH that was convened by the um, advisory committee to the general director. And over that year, we worked on uh, a number of different things to try to kind of get a sense of the landscape of AI and public um, and public health and biomedical research, and to see where there are opportunities for interventions. And uh, even in that report, which we had submitted back in December 2019, which feels like you know uh, a decade ago at this point, we were really concerned about health inequalities and disparities, and that has only become more true. Um, since we submitted that and since um, uh, since that had been approved by the NIH. And so uh, if, you, if you're interested in learning more, you can go on my website, the full report is available there, but I'm happy to share more about other work that, uh, that we're doing. But something that's worth uh, kind of recognizing here is that it's great that we're, we're, we're able to measure some things and that we're able to measure some things with better, uh, with more accuracy, with more granularity uh, in ways that we hadn't been able to before and all that. But there's a risk here that we're running, which is that we can assume that if we are able to diagnose something better, then maybe that will automatically lead to some solution or to some, some treatment, right? That's a very tempting thing to assume. But as Dr. Ruha Benjamin puts it, data in short, do not speak for themselves. They don't always change hearts and minds or policy. And what Dr. Benjamin is saying here, or I'll just kind of add my own editorialization to it, is that there are a lot of problems here where we know the extent of the problem pretty well. If you're thinking about, let's say, homelessness in the US or mass incarceration, we know that it is a massive, massive problem. We really, it's not a numbers thing. It's not like if there was only, you know, one more million people who were affected by this or 10 more or even 50 more million people, then that would necessarily change things. It doesn't, right? We've lost, you know, many people to this pandemic and the response has been um, at best lacking um, and, and really disappointing. And so there's some things where better measurements is not necessarily going to lead to uh, an intervention or a policy change uh, just because we like we just have a larger number that we that we've been able to identify have been affected by this problem, right? There's there's sort of willpower and consensus that is needed, and so it's really important to keep that in mind. I think this this kind of diagnostic flavor of computing can be useful in surfacing new issues and kind of adding maybe more evidence for changes that are needed. But it's important to not assume that it's going to necessarily lead to uh, to changes in and of itself. But in, in also saying that it's important to recognize that computing has informed treatment as well, right? Uh, or interventions or solutions here. Um, in particular, in sort of one corner of computer science where I spend much of my time, which is the economics and computation literature, there is a lot of work that has been really groundbreaking uh, where, uh, for instance, uh, people have used mechanism design for allocating um, uh, allocating kidneys, right, for a kidney exchange or for assigning students to public schools and um, allocating low-income housing resources and really many other crucial crucial resources, many of which can be a matter of life or, or death or a matter of educational equity or a matter of being, being able to be housed or not housed, right? And so in this, in this way, um, there's been decades uh, of, of computing research or comput computationally informed research that has been informing uh, practice that has been informing interventions and solutions. And there, there's an interesting role that computing plays, which is its role as a sort of formalizer, right? Which is that a lot of times there are social problems that, uh, that we would like to understand and we'd like to do something about, but we can't always be very explicit and concrete about them. And computing has this property that it requires that you're very explicit. Ambiguity is seen as a bug in computer science, right? And so you need to be, if you have to, if you're trying to solve something, you need to be clear about what your inputs are, what your goals are, what your objectives are, what the output is going to be. And, and if you would like, also you can think about how you're gonna you know, use that output to change, um, to change practice, but that part is not always seen as part of computer science. More on that later. 
Uh, but again, it kind of, it forces you to be very concrete and, and specific. And here it's important to recognize that sort of vagueness is an important political tool, right? It gives you the flexibility uh, it gives you flexibility and sort of wide latitude for interpretation and that might be necessary for consensus building. But it can also be harmful because, you know, for instance, if I see something like the social worker must act in the best interest of the child or employer aims to hire the most qualified candidate or housing assistance programs aim to help the most number of people, there's a lot of vagueness. I mean, these sentences are ones that most people would agree with, maybe everyone would agree with, but there's a lot of vagueness in, in the sentence, right? What do I mean by you know, act in the best interest of a child? What does it mean to act and what does it mean in the best interest? What does it mean for someone to be the most qualified person? Or what does it mean to help people in housing? Or what does it mean to even say the most number of people, right? There's a lot of vagueness here. Um, I mean, there's a lot more vagueness than what I'm pointing out, but this vagueness can be, uh, can also be harmful, right? Who gets to decide what the best interest uh, for a child is who gets to decide what the most qualified applicant, what the most qualified applicant is, right? These are these are things that end up getting uh, delegated to someone else that are, that are sort of in the background who makes these consequential decisions and uh, and ones maybe that we don't necessarily agree with. And so something I really like about computing, and I if I if I can say so, uh, I think it's pretty underappreciated, is that the fact that it forces you to be concrete or unambiguous can actually be an excellent thing. It can provide an opportune site for contestation and as a natural target for advocacy. It can force you to have conversations that are hard to have, uh, but are necessary to have too, right? Because we can all agree that social workers must act in the best interest of a child and then you know, kind of wipe our hands and walk away, but then things can still fall apart afterwards. And so we need to be concrete about what we mean by each of these words in that sentence, and computing actually forces you to to do that. And I think that can be uh, that can be something that can be leveraged for uh, for good. So what could that look like in practice? Um, I'll give you kind of a very quick example. I don't want to go on for too long here, but one thing that we know is, for instance, um, in the U.S., we have a sort of we've always had. I'm, I don't know if it's always. Uh, we've had a housing crisis for some time. It's gotten a lot worse during the pandemic because people have lost their jobs and are not able to pay rent, right? And in many settings, uh, what, what happens is that we talk about um, housing um, assistance programs um, as being sort of scarce, right? And so we ask questions around, well, look, you know, this is a scarce resource and we're not necessarily allocating it in the best way uh, to sort of mitigate housing instability or eviction or homelessness. Right? And so we kind of think of it as like an efficiency, as, as an efficiency question. That's how it's talked about often. But if you're thinking about this, if you're trying to solve this in a kind of, um, in, a, in a computational way, you now have to be very explicit about a bunch of things, right? So this is precisely what we end up doing in this, um, in this work that I won't get into in, in much detail, but basically in this work, what we were looking at was how income shocks um, like, you know, losing your job or even like a delayed paycheck or an unexpected expense and things like that, how those shocks could end up sort of uh, starting a, um, uh, could end up making people vulnerable, uh, very vulnerable to the point where they end up getting evicted and things like that, right? And so we had this sort of modeling question and then we wanted to ask questions around um, if you wanted to minimize the number of people that experience eviction, what is the best way for you to allocate your resources? Right, and so this, I'm not gonna get into the details of this project, obviously, but, uh, but what I wanna say here is that we sort of had this like, um, uh, we had this modeling challenge, right? So we modeled people's welfare uh, or people's um, sort of uh, 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 economic welfare using not just people's income and wealth, but also how susceptible they might be experiencing to uh, experiencing income shocks and how deep those shocks might be. Right? And so we had this model, we then were able to ask a set of optimization questions around, let's say if you're giving out income subsidies, what is the best way for you to kind of give out that income subsidy to minimize you know, the number of people that experience eviction or whatever it is that you wanna look at. And there I'll drop a link to the paper in the chat if you wanna take a look further, but, we, but by, by sort of being very explicit about this, uh, about this model and this problem, what we saw was that it, it ended up leading to a lot of really surprising results. So we saw that, for instance, if you only take people's income into account and in solving this optimization problem versus you take their income and their experiences with shocks into account, the, op the optimization problem itself, which is, you know, which you solved optimally in certain situations, 
can tell you to target entirely disjoint sets of people, right? It basically says, if I only knew what your income was, I'll tell you to, to help these groups of people. That's what, that is what the optimal thing is to minimize the number of people that experience eviction. Whereas if I now know not just their income, but also what shocks they're experiencing, I, I change my mind. I say, oh no, actually you should be targeting this other groups of people, right? And so what information you have access to actually ends up changing the, the optimal thing to do pretty significantly. And we saw the same thing also with the objective function. So uh, we saw like we looked through two um, very natural objective functions. One of them was minimizing the expected number of people that experience eviction. And the other one was uh, minimizing the most the likelihood that the most vulnerable person experiences eviction, right? So one of them is sort of helping people on average, like in expectation, we just wanna help the most number of people. The other one is saying, who's the most vulnerable person? I'm going to try to make make their life as easy as I can and just kind of keep going, right? So it's sort of lifting the floor in that sense. And it turns out under very natural assumptions where we solve this problem optimally, these two different objective functions, both of which seem reasonable, could actually tell you to do entirely different things. And we also saw that with the intervention type. So if you're giving out income subsidies versus a one-time upfront wealth subsidy, you could actually uh, you could actually end up in a situation where the optimal thing to do for one versus the other look very very different. And so I'm sweeping a lot of kind of technical details under the rug, but I do want to share with you these three key takeaways. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because the process of formalizing this question, right, and the process of uh, being very explicit about what are we taking into account, what are what is the thing that we're optimizing for, what are we taking as given, and in particular, we assume there's a fixed budget and you have to allocate that, all of that, and then trying to solve this optimization problem already showed us a situation where two very reasonable um, variations of the problem could result in entirely different solutions. It could say help group A versus help group B, even though both of these solutions look very uh, very, both of these uh, form formalizations look very interesting, they look very reasonable. And that was, I thought, you know, really useful and actually yielded a sort of a policy insight, which is that if you step back and you think about housing in, um, in the US and in particular housing assistance that we give here in the US, most people who need it are not getting it. And this, you know, this um, information that I have from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is from like 2019, I think, or maybe even before, right? And so even before the pandemic, a lot of people who desperately need assistance were not getting the, the, the help that they needed. And that has only gotten worse with the pandemic. And so it's kind of disingenuous to, uh, to, to talk about this issue as a sort of efficiency problem to say, look, if we only knew how to allocate this thing more efficiently, then maybe so many people wouldn't be struggling. No, because you look at this problem where we were able to like work with a very stylized model and a very basic setting. And already we had these pretty um, shocking, in my opinion, shocking results where it tells you to do entirely different uh, different things depending on how you define the most number of people. Did you define it as a min sum or a min max, right? It already tells you to do entirely different things. And so here, I think this uh, role of computing as a formalizer can also be used against like this, these, these types of, um, uh, I think, you know, these types of arguments that are like kind of efficiency based or maybe other arguments that are not really necessarily capturing exactly what's going on right and so here the argument would be that no the issue is not efficiency the issue is that we need more funding because there is no optimization problem at least for the kind of the modeling decisions that we've made that can kind of help you get out of the spine around the fact that um you should be, you know, you, you, sh you would be looking at different sets of people depending on these sort of uh, uh, almost minor decisions that you make and how you formalize the question, right? And so it says, look, we need more funding. That is what is needed in this situation. And so, so I wanna kind of step back again and come back to the point that we made earlier, which is that computing can support a broad social change. I've showed you two examples uh, uh, of the types of roles that it can play. Uh, but an important thing to recognize here, again, is that computing is not the whole, the whole story here at all. It's intentionally not the whole story because, again, no one field is going to solve everything. It certainly is not going to be computer science, right? And so we also have to think about not just like how are we a part of something, how do we kind of carefully scope out the role that we can play, we also need to think about how we're intersecting and, and linking with other uh, with other experts and other people um, in this space who, who play an important role. And so 
so in particular, I think it's important to think about, well, you wrote the paper, that's great. What then, right? What happens after that you write the paper? And actually, in fact, also what happens before you write the paper? How do you formulate the question? And so a thing that I think constantly about and I would like to emphasize in this talk is that as researchers in computer science, but also other fields, we have a responsibility to shape how our research is being used and how it's understood. A lot of times it's really tempting to say, look, I wrote the paper, any other computer scientist can read it. And so why is it my job to make sure that um, you know, a policymaker is not walking away with the wrong impression or some, you know, a journalist is not walking away with the wrong impression or whatever, right? Why is that my job? It's very easy to, to think that we have, at least in computer science, it is a field that has a lot of power and a lot of resources. And so there is, if you wanted to, you could just talk to other computer scientists and no one else. And, you know, um, you wouldn't necessarily be threatening, say, your security in your field or your job or something, right? And I don't think that's a good thing, right? A lot of times we say things around like, well, look, you know, that's an engineering job. What's the pol that's a policymaker's job? Or, you know, we don't really consider that pop subpopulation or that's an implementation issue. You know, it's not really our problem, right? Or, you know, I'm just a scientist or I'm just an engineer. I'm just a researcher. You hear many of these things, right? Oh, we don't consider that. As though this is something that is sort of ancillary to the work that we're doing, right? Like someone else will figure that out. We don't need to. We've done the interesting research and so we're moving on. And so I think it's really important to reclaim that and to say, no, actually, I care about the work that I've done. And, and as part of that, I also care about how it's being understood by those within and outside of my field. And I'm going to take that responsibility and make sure that I've done my part to make sure that the insights are translated out of the field in a, in a way that is, is the way that I intended and that is useful. And to do that, we also need to build uh, real partnerships with domain experts and in particular affected communities, right? Um, and this is where I come back to the point of like, what research are you even are you even asking? What questions are you even asking? Because that is informed by what you're exposed to. If you're belonging to marginalized communities or you are um, working with uh, individuals that are directly affected by the problems that you're trying to understand, if you're working with domain experts, you're more likely to ask questions that are getting to the heart of the matter. And I think more the, the, and, and, the, and I think are more interesting questions. And so this is really important to both think about, you know, I've done the research, how does it get translated, but also how does the practice and the policy and sort of what's happening day to day on the ground um, impacting the questions that I'm asking. So I think of this as a sort of cycle and a cycle that has to be built on sort of mutual trust and respect for, uh, for everyone in across that entire sort of well, I guess it's like a pipeline, but it's like a cycle, right? You really have to kind of think very carefully about that. So this is something that we think a lot about in an initiative mechanism designed for social good that um, I, I helped co-found back in 2016 um, and have been co-organizing with various folks. So this initiative is, um, a lot of folks are kind of like myself, they're um, computational uh, people in economics and computer science and operations research and related fields. We use algorithms, optimization, mechanism design, but we're also interested in learning and being informed by um, uh, uh, other social sciences and um, humanistic studies to understand how we can help improve access to opportunity for marginalized and historically disadvantaged communities. So I get to you know, work with these wonderful uh, folks that you see here. Um, and this group is now large, but it started as a small uh, reading group. It was like 10 people back in 2016. We really were just trying to like read papers with each other and try to learn where we can contribute. Uh, this was with Kara Goldner that um, who also helped co-found this initiative. Uh, we were both graduate students at the time and we wanted to see where our set of skills could be useful. And so we just wanted to read papers, talk to people from different disciplines and see, uh, see what we can learn and how we can contribute. Uh, and since then, it's now grown into a much larger initiative. So that summer, uh, this reading group was actually happening online, I forgot to say. So this is back in 2016 when online stuff was not as necessary, but we still had a system. We were all in different institutions, or many of us were in different institutions, and we uh, were meeting biweekly to learn from one another and with one another. But that summer, we had we held a small workshop um, at the Economics and Computation Conference. It was uh, well received. We were excited about it, and we weren't really sure that it would happen again. But since then, it's really exploded. So now the initiative has over 2,000 people. Um, if you're interested, you can join. It's uh, you know you go to mdfrsg.com and there's a form that you can fill out and uh, and you're there. Uh, it's uh, it, it involves individuals, researchers, practitioners, policymakers from 
Um, this is actually an undercount. It's like now close to 150 institutions in, uh, in over 40 different countries with a very big presence in the African continent and Latin America, especially, uh, and also uh, North, North America as well. And we have, we've had a technical workshop series at the conference that I mentioned to you for uh, several years. Um, we've had other events, tutorials, you know, uh, other things like that at other venues as well. We've also had an online colloquium series that happens monthly. It's you know one of my favorite events. I uh, always appreciate learning from people that we that we really look up to and we think are doing exemplary work. Um, we also have these um, online working groups that are domain specific and really try to get to the bottom of things, right? So really, like one of the groups that I'm part of is the inequality group. We have been working and learning together for quite some time. Uh, we've had tutorials. We've had we've written papers. We've talked to. Uh, organizations just today, we were working with uh, people at Benefits Data Trust, um, an organization that makes uh, uh, public benefits more accessible to individuals in the United States, right? So we really, we've been doing a lot of stuff. We're working actually towards creating a syllabus that can be used more broadly that um, uh, that we think, you know, is, is capturing something uh, new at the interface of economics and kind of algorithmic game theory mechanism design and computer science more generally. And so uh, so this, this group has been really generative for me for my own research. Uh, these dom uh, domain specific working groups have been an especially important part of that. Um, and there's been, you know, this is a screenshot from, uh, you know, about a year ago, it's now expanded to nine working groups um, and, and many more that we've had before that have now kind of run their course um, and done incredible things and kind of moved on to different, different uh, topics as well. And the colloquium series, we've had some really incredible people, including uh, Professor, Professor Al Roth, whose work I mentioned in passing earlier on Kidney Exchange. He's a, a Nobel Prize winner in economics. We've had Dr. Arabase, who is you know, one of the most influential figures in the um, information communication technology for, develop, for, for development uh, field and uh, just an important figure in policymaking in the African continent as well. So really just a lot of wonderful people and exciting news that I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to share with you is that our workshop series has now grown into a full-fledged um, ACM conference. Um, it's happening on October uh, 5 to 8. Um, it's, we've now renamed it to be EMO, uh, which, which I'm really excited about. Uh, but also the, the renaming was partially to capture sort of the scope of our community. So it's now called Equity and Access in Algorithms, Mechanisms, and Optimization. Um, so the acronym is EMO. And it's happening online, although I hope um, that physical events by then will not be as impossible, but we just wanted to kind of play safe and be have it be online. So you can go to the website, uh, you, can, you can go to the Twitter. A lot of things are a little bit sparse right now because it actually has not officially launched. You guys are getting like a sneak preview into what's about to happen, but um, it will be in the next week. And I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to share that and also to answer any questions you might have about either the conference, but also just MD4SG more generally or my own work. And with that, I'll stop. I've talked for almost an hour, wow. And I would be happy to discuss or answer any questions or, or hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Rajan. <laughs> that was fantastic. I, uh, um, I have a bunch of questions of my own, but we've got one uh, that has just come in uh, from anonymous attendee. Uh, but uh, uh, the attendee asks, regarding the diagnostic research for searches on HIV, have you been able to follow up on the results and do search engines respond quickly to these sorts of investigations? Uh, are there channels for reporting those kinds of issues? I love that question. Um, so. Right, so I did this work back in summer of 2019 when I think um, even those of us who are maybe suspicious of big tech were, uh, were feeling a bit more warm towards, <laughs> towards big tech corporations than, uh, than we do now. And so I'll be honest about what we did then and then I'll, I'll, I'll be honest about what I wish we would do, right? Uh, or I don't know that I would have been able to do more at the time. So what we did then was we took, we took these results but also a bunch of other results from the paper uh, that I didn't mention, also a bunch of results that didn't make it into the paper because it didn't necessarily fit the scope. And we gave it to the uh, uh, the Bing um, health team. And we said, here, here are things that we've learned. Please do something about them. <laughs> this is not good, right? Because it was a lot of, I mean, I showed you some samples of things that, that I thought were troubling. There was way more, right? It was like a summer that I spent just like reading all this stuff and just being really troubled about when, when information we're making accessible. And so 
I don't know what they did. They didn't necessarily share. Um, I didn't want to push because I was, you know, just like an intern at the time um, and one that, you know, wasn't even sure that I could finish grad school. So, you know, I certainly was not feeling uh, kind of confident about pushing anyone on any of this, but, you know, we wanted to share. It wasn't going to make it into the paper, but we were like, hey, we really think you can change things here. And it seemed like they were receptive. I don't know the details of what they actually changed, uh, but it seemed like they were already thinking about it and interested. But in the process of having those conversations, I mean, I don't want to talk about Bing specifically. It doesn't really matter. I think this is probably a big tech problem more generally. But there were a lot of things that made me feel like the continent of Africa is an after as an afterthought at best, right? There were things that I noticed, like, you know, okay, this is public, so I can just tell you at the time, you know, Bing didn't have ads in Africa. And we asked why not? And they were like, oh, we just didn't get around to it. And it's not that I want ads, you know, in Africa, maybe it's actually good that they weren't there, uh, but they were just providing the service for free because they just never really got around to it. And so I, I wondered what other things uh, that are actually good are you also not doing because you just never got around to it, right? If the continent is an afterthought for your financial interests, I'm guessing it's definitely an afterthought for like their health and, and, and well-being too, right? And so I think that, you know, the time for just sort of like accepting um, no regulation for big tech has now passed, which is good, right? I don't know that we've necessarily done anything about it. I don't know that we'll necessarily do anything about it, but I think that there's now much more widespread recognition that for things that are this influential, like search engines, we really, we really need to have sort of public say and, uh, and, and regulation and control, at least for questions that are like a matter of life or death, which, which this certainly is. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and the, the, the misinformation around COVID is only, you know, uh, right. making this even clearer, right? right. Um, we've got a couple more questions come in. Uh, Catherine Johnson uh, says, your comments on diversion really resonate with me. Uh, in part of my research, we have been trying to help students reevaluate the problem definition to see if more creative, often non-technical solutions uh, or, or solution concepts should be considered. And do you have any recommendations for helping students identify diversions and therefore better understand how the culture of their fields shapes understanding? Yeah, I appreciate that question, Catherine. So I think this is not a student problem. I think this is an educator problem. I think this is something that needs to be taken on by, so I'm in academia, so I'll say by faculty, right? Um, certainly by university administrators and colleges. I, you know, students are, we get to help shape how they think about the world and how uh, and what they learn. And so I think that responsibility is on us. So I'll say what one thing I've done. So I certainly appreciate just good problem for formulation. Sometimes like I don't even want the solution. I just want to, I just want you to tell me what the problem is to convince me that that's an important problem. Even that feels like an, a significant contribution. So something we've done for the EMO conference that I've mentioned is um, the call for papers is not yet out this you really are you, you all are really getting like a real sneak preview into it, but when it's out this week you'll see that we not only have. Um, submissions in the form of research papers, which are very common, we also have a call for uh, policy and practice and so in the call for policy and practice. There are different types of submissions, you can have so one of them is just the problem pitch so you can show up and you can say here's a problem. I'm gonna to try to explain to you what the problem is as concretely as I can. I'm gonna to try to tell you what we've tried in this field, what, what worked, what didn't work, why there's still a huge gap, why trying to address this problem could really make a difference for marginalized groups, right? And that's it, you don't need to solve anything. You don't need to say, here's what we should be trying, none of it, right? You just have to kind of explicitly state what the problem is. Um, and the problem should of course be something where you think computational techniques may have a uh, uh, kind of a positive role to play, right? But it doesn't have to be, we don't know. You just don't know what uh, what's, what, what will solve what until you've actually done it. And so uh, I think prioritizing just like good problem formulation, incentivizing that in academic fields, right? Just incentivizing it by saying, if you have a good question, that already is a significant contribution. I think it's important. We can take that into account in how we evaluate people and how we evaluate people when um, looking at applications, looking at promotion cases, all this stuff, looking at citations, uh, things like that. I think we we could decide collectively, all of us could decide that a good question is a meaningful contribution. And, and then that would solve so many different things, honestly. It wouldn't solve everything, but it really would change the incentive structure and I think make a meaningful contribution. And in the same way, I think also incentivizing 
good public communication. Not everyone has to do it, right? I don't think that you know everyone has to play the full research to practice pipeline, but if no one did, that's also a loss. Um, and yet as it stands right now in academia, at least, that's not really incentivized. Anything that you do outside of your field, conversations that you have outside of your field, you know, things that you might do kind of in a public is not necessarily seen um, as a valuable contribution. It's at times actually um, seen as a, as a downside, right? It's like, oh, well, you're talking about this all the time. Why don't you just like do your research instead as though that's not part of the research. And so I think I would say the responsibility is, is on us. I think the students will very easily follow and even lead if we set the right example. And that, that's a perfect segue into a question from our, our colleague, Justin Latici here uh, about communication. Um, and he's wondering what challenges you have faced in trying to communicate your work to broader audiences. Um, and if you have any thoughts about how we should rethink the way we communicate in yeah. academic and technical circles. Yeah, this is such, I mean, I'm still learning. Thank you for the great question, Justin. I have, um, yeah, I've learned a lot. I, I mean, I'm still learning a lot. So I've learned to be more patient. I'm not, you know, I'm not like a particularly patient person, but I've learned to be a lot more patient. There's just a lot that you don't know. And so you don't know what resonates with people. You don't know what, what if your work is necessary to share and is not helpful to share, right? Like really condensing that as an iterative process that is, um, that is hard. Um, in computer science, we're not really trained to write well. Honestly, it's actually like really bad if I'm being honest, because I have, you know, people close to me who are in the humanities and they read some of our papers and they're just like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is like kind of embarrassing. Like, this is what you guys just published and that's that, right? And I, that needs to change. That is not, that is not okay. But we do have a culture in computer science where, you know, we have these like quick turnaround conferences. There's this culture of like, okay, what am I submitting to in Europe this year? Okay, there's three months to it. Let me just try to do the research and then write the paper the week before essentially, that's not okay. That's gonna be a terrible way to communicate re your research even to the people in your field and certainly to people outside, right? And, um, and we don't necessarily have community wisdom about how, where you would even go to communicate your work outside. I think if you like played a game where you went to the computer science department in your, in your, at your university and you made them like, and you made the people there list, you know, 10 departments and what building they're in, I, I would, I would bet you, you would find that really, really funny, right? Like people don't have no idea where other, where their other colleagues are based. And that's such a shame because, you know, I've been at all these institutions that have like some of the most groundbreaking, uh, like people who've done some of the most groundbreaking work in so many different fields. And yet, like, we don't even know a building they're in, let alone, you know, how to talk to them. And like, you can't talk to everyone, but you should talk to some people. Someone should talk to some people, right? And so I think, yeah, there's just a much deeper cultural change that needs to happen. Um, I'll say, you know, I, I, I am a bit of an optimist here. I think the fact that we've had such public failures in computer science has kind of forced us to have these hard conversations. I really hope it sticks when, you know, the field or like, you know, the world has sort of moved on to other things. But Probably not. I think technology has always been like the thing people are most concerned about. So in that sense, I feel like computer science will always be sort of a little bit in the spotlight. And so maybe that will keep forcing us to be better about this. Um, and I'll say also, actually, I'm, I'm hopeful. I really am hopeful. Uh, uh, one of the things that I really liked about computer science, why I decided to move into computer science for math is because I have such broad interests. I'm interested in so many different things. And I felt like computer science was a place where that allowed me to be very nimble and to engage with many different fields. And, and I really like that. I know that's true for other fields too, but I felt that especially for computer science. And so I'm hopeful. I really am hopeful about, you know, where we might be able to get to if we just kind of keep having these hard conversations. Oh, yeah. And I would note, I, I'm an anthropologist and we're the same way. I, I, uh, I like to say, you know, I spent better part of a decade at doing my PhD at UC Irvine. And there are buildings on that campus I have never been inside. Right. <laughs> I don't know who's there either. What's um, in that building? I don't know, maybe no one. Maybe it's just an empty building, who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Could be, right? Um, oh, so we have another question from uh, Adam Fuller, um, who says, thanks for sharing your perspectives. Related to global perspectives on inequality, is your group doing any research related to the ways computing is being used mm -hmm. by 
authoritarian regimes and ways to combat that broader level of technological persecution, which I think is- Yeah, good question. So the inequality group has been really focused on sort of public service allocations and sort of related problems, targeting universalism, that, those types of questions. So really more economic questions. There is a group on um, algorithms, law and policy that just started um, like a couple of months ago. And that group has focused on um, like online hate speech and uh, uh, we're, we're focused on also digital forensics of tools that are used in law enforcement um, and criminal justice um, in the US especially, but also you know around the world, a lot of these tools are being used more broadly. We haven't focused on sort of authoritarian regimes specifically. Well, I guess there is a group also that's focused on misinformation, which is certainly related. Um, uh, and it's a new group, so if you're interested, you you are able to join. Shoot me a note, and I can connect you. Uh, we meet biweekly for the working group wide meetings, but there's like project groups that meet more frequently. Um, but I'm hoping actually we'll do more and more in this direction because I I I agree with what you're implying that this is a, a problem that may only be getting way worse over time around the world. And sort of sort of related, I think. Uh, uh, another qu question from a uh, uh, anonymous. Um, do you think that the change in the perception of big tech companies has worsened the dialogue between computer scientists and non-computer scientists? And if so, how? <laughs> that's a yeah, little, that's given, a good question. Given, um, given your, uh, uh, well, that's a really, really good question. Uh, yeah, I will have to think about that. I'll say that, um, I'll say that it's both. I don't know which side outweighs the other, so I don't know. I can't. I can't say on net which what it is. So I think, for so for instance, for myself, you know, a lot of these opinions I have, I've always had them. Nothing really changed. I've just felt more empowered to say them. I now have more information to back my points and things like that. Right, but that was that's always been sort of my inclination anyway. Um, and so I think for people like myself, I'm by no means an exception. There's a lot of people that feel similar to me um, or kind of adjacent to how I feel, we now are able to say these things a lot more explicitly and kind of push for these changes a lot more so because there's just things that you can point out and say, come on, <laughs> you know, anyone can agree that this is terrible, right? So I think for us, it's definitely helped. Uh, it really, I think it's kind of created like a, um, a lot more things that we can all hold, hold on to together and sort of concrete things that we can push towards. Um, much more so than before. I mean, all of that was there before. It didn't start with any of these like crises that we're dealing with over the past year, but it really has helped us. But I, I agree also that it's made things worse for some, right? Like there are people in our field that, mm, let's just say like they don't necessarily understand all the injustices that are out there. Like that's just like the best explanation that I have, the most generous explanation that I have. The less generous explanation that I have is that they completely understand it and they like it that way because they're at the top of the hierarchy, right? And so wherever they fall, you know, I don't really care about the intent. I do care about what actually ended up happening, which is that, you know, their actions are are increasing inequality and and marginalizing people and leading to deaths, right? This is this is really is a matter of life and death. And so in those situations, I fear that there are groups that are getting defensive, more, more defensive. I think that the conversation has gotten very divisive. I, there was a period when I just like logged off a bunch of social media because I was like, I can't, I can't deal with this. Like, I just can't deal with the conversations that are happening. Um, you know, what will happen to that? I have no idea. I, I have no idea. Uh, I, the thing that gives me hope, I guess I'll just end on like a positive note here is that I, I really like my job. Uh, it's it's a it's it's such an awesome job. I'm really glad that being a professor is a job that exists. It's an awesome awesome job because you get to educate people when they're a lot of them when they're like 18, right? And they're showing up. They just finished high school and they're like, I think I'm interested in this field. I don't know, you know, what do you got to teach me, right? And you get to to help shape and um, and educate that that group. And that group is you know is the future and. I don't know, I haven't been a professor for that long, so I don't know what patterns have emerged, but to me, it feels like there is definitely a shift. I've lived on college campuses for a while. I've been uh, you know, very involved in undergraduate life as a graduate student as well um, in various capacities. And so I feel like I've definitely sensed a shift. So I'm hopeful about the future and kind of people who are like-minded to me who are entering the field, but yeah, but not everyone is, so I don't know, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I have a question that uh, is a little self-serving because as a social scientist at a engineering school, I think about this a lot, but um, uh, I, I wonder if you could say anything about um, uh, the sort of your identity as a computer scientist or just, you know, or computer scientist identity in general and the role that like social awareness and social understanding plays in that. Because I think that, I mean, you, you talked about this a little bit in your talk that, yeah. that there's this, um, <laughs> this artificial separation that goes on sometimes in the, yeah. the way that we talk about it and all that. And, and I mean, one thing that I hope to try to, I, I see a few of my students are, are here today. And um, one thing I try to poke at is that like, you know, actually the social part of the socio-technical is also important to pay attention to. Right, right, um, yeah. I know I, I saw you speak a few years ago and you mentioned how when you were at Cornell, you had to seek out um, yeah. sociology lectures and anthropology lectures and stuff. Um, yeah, but but could you speak a little bit to like- Yeah, happy to, that's my favorite, that's my favorite. <laughs> that's my favorite. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I feel like, you know, I, I guess I'm only going to feel this more as time goes on. So, you know, I wasn't, I was in college not that long ago. It really was, it was like 10 years ago, right? It's not that long ago. And I look at stuff that I've written. So I wrote for our college newspaper when I was a college student. And I read the stuff that I wrote and I was writing about the stuff that I'm working on now. At the time I was in math, I was a math major, but I was looking at algorithms that are being used for assigning students to public schools and how that those algorithms, because they don't take into account residential segregation were amplifying inequalities in education. Right? Like I was writing about this. I had no idea that this could be studied using computer science. I don't know why I didn't connect these dots, right? But I, I really was. And so in some ways, like a lot of the things that I really care about now, I've always cared about. It, it really, the writing was on the wall from you know the very earliest writing of my own that I could find, which is only in college. So I, I don't know, right? But it was always there. And so what I really like about computer science um, and why I get even extra angry and upset that it is a field that has a lot of gatekeeping is that it's a field that is so agile. It is incredibly agile because it is so young. It was not that long ago that we started giving out PhDs in computer science. It really was. And I think it's only like in the 70s or something, right? You know, there are many people who've gotten the first computer science degree from their universities that are out there. You can go find them and talk to them, right? And they'll tell you. And so the fact that it is new to me is, is like a gift because, you know, when I was in math, people were like, it's nice that you have these interests, but sorry, we decided what the important problems were like 200 years ago. So like, if you're not interested in those problems, like, we don't know how to necessarily help you. It's like a little bit of an exaggeration, but not by much, honestly. If you're working in number theory, like, <laughs> you know, people have decided what the important problems are, and anything else is like kind of, it's nice, but it's not going to get you tenure, right? It's like, that's, that's basically how it goes. And so the fact that computer science is new as a field, to me, as an opportunity to help foster a field that is equity and justice driven, because God knows that not many other fields are. And so actually, it's not just, I mean, right now we're playing catch up, right? We're trying to like mitigate the harms that we've caused and we're trying to like do some good things out there. And we're, we're really, we're trying to figure out kind of our identity as a computer science community. But I, I hold out hope that actually we can be a field that is justice and equity driven, that we could actually be like a, you know, the, the, the justice field, right? Like we could be that. We have, we have that ability. We have a lot of the ingredients of a field that could have that. And so I'm going to keep holding on to that, even if it doesn't happen, because, you know, any corner of it that I can make like that is, is worth it, I think. Well, that's a really hopeful, optimistic note. I like that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't know if, if there are any uh, other questions, but um, I, I really want to thank you for sharing your time and your insights with us. This has been fantastic and uh, wishing you the best of luck. I don't know when you're going to make that that move out. Tomorrow to morning, <laughs> actually. So. <laughs> Okay. So tomorrow morning is when I fly. So yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Well, <laughs> get some rest. So wish me, wish me luck. <laughs> yeah. Best of luck. To you. Thank you so much. That was so great. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. And thank you, Stevie. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good Bye. luck. Thanks. Bye. Have a good day. You too.